What's going on guys? It's Bradders from Rabbit Viper Games here and we are on the brink of history in humankind. In case you've been living under a rock for the past nine years or so, you will know that on July 14th, 2015, humanity will get its first close-up look of the planet of Pluto. That's right, well it's not really a planet anymore, it's classed as a dwarf planet, it was of course downgraded to a dwarf planet I think about 2006 if I'm correct. And um, we will see that via the New Horizons spacecraft, which was launched about nine years ago and has arrived at its destination well, pretty much to within a few million miles at this current time. As of recording this, New Horizons is about four days away from closest approach, and this is my rather terrible rendition of it in Kerbal Space Program. You can see here, it's got the little RTG on it, like the New Horizons spacecraft. You can see here I've done my best to um, sort of represent the inst instrumentation, but there is only so much you can actually do with Kerbal Space Program um, instruments and stuff like that. This is a completely vanilla save, apart from Piper Edit, which I have installed anyway. But yeah, I am flying but I am flying um, in the influence of ELU at the moment. Um, ELU is nothing like Pluto, other than the fact that it's the one of the furthest objects out. You can see just how far the sun is away. You can see we're getting hardly any light reflected off here. These are little solar panels on the inside here. Um, but they would hardly work at all uh, because the sun is just so far away. I like the way the Kerbal Space Program does actually model that. The actual planet of, or dwarf planet of Pluto itself is actually a lot further out than Elu is relative to Kerbal. It's, some, it's like something like 10 times the distance or something like that of Elu to Kerbal. It's, a, it's so far that it takes about, it takes data relayed from the New Horizons spacecraft about uh, 17 hours traveling at the speed of light to go from the radio dish on the New Horizons spacecraft all the way back to Earth, which is somewhere around here at, um, at the point. Uh, this representation, like I say, is flawed to say the, to say the most. Like I say, I used HyperEdit to get myself into orbit around ELU. That's not what New Horizons is doing. New Horizons is traveling very, very fast. I'm not sure what the speed actually, what speed it actually is going at, um, but it was launched atop an Atlas V with every conceivable booster about nine years ago, and um, it within 18 hours it had passed the orbit of the Moon within 18 hours of launch. The Apollo missions took around three days to get to the Moon, so there is a definite difference with regards to speed there. So obviously it's got a tiny little thruster on it, the New Horizons spacecraft, um, with regards to um, with regards to actual Delta V. It does have quite a lot of Delta V, but that is to mostly just adjust its course on the way to Pluto to make sure it can avoid any hazards, any of um, any of, Pl of Pluto's many moons, and it has it has about four, five or six, I reckon. Let me try and name them off the top of my head. There's Sharon, which is obviously the the largest moon, which is the sort of like a binary system between the two and the planets, well, the dwarf planets orbit the center of mass as they go around the sun rather than Charon orbiting Pluto. Then we have several captured asteroids is what we're assume, assuming they are. We have Styx, Nix, um, Cerebus, if that's how you pronounce it. I'm probably butchering the names here. And I think that's them all. Styx, Nix, Cerebus, and Hydra. That's the other one. I remembered, hooray. But um, because New Horizons is traveling so fast and its engine is just so tiny, it doesn't have enough fuel to actually um, get itself into orbit around Pluto. And so it's just going to do a very brief flyby. Unlike the two Voyager space craft though, it isn't going to um, escape our solar system and it isn't going to fly off like a lot of people are thinking. Instead, NASA are planning to extend the mission, providing that everything goes well. So this um, this spacecraft can actually um, it can actually fly through the Kuiper Belt because it is on course with its current orbit around the Sun. Um, if I zoom right out here, this isn't a, a representation in Kerbal Space Program. Obviously, on the Kerbal Space Program, um, everything is not like real life at all. But if let's imagine this is Pluto, um, Pluto's orbit is obviously a bit more circular than this. It's still very elliptical, but it's still a bit more circular than this. Pluto, um, New Horizons is planning to fly by Pluto um, around this sort of direction. It's planning to loop out around this sort of way and then um, encounter another Kuiper Belt object. Um, I can't remember the name of that either, 
but it is actually on course to intercept another Kuiper Belt object in some time in a few years. And so the mission will be extended to that period so that um, the Kuiper Belt can be explored in more detail. In case you're not aware of what the Kuiper Belt is, the Kuiper Belt is sort of, it's sort of like a planetary graveyard right on the edge of our solar system. Um, it's where loads of rocky and icy bodies are um, that are left over essentially from building the planets. So any excess material, obviously we have the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. Um, that which is full of asteroids and leftover material. This is mostly comets, mostly water ice and stuff like that. And many people theorize that a lot of the the, uh, the water from Earth's oceans have actually come from the Kuiper Belt, from objects being knocked. Um, let's imagine there was two comets here and here. They they collided in their orbits. This would knock the inside comet onto a orbital trajectory. Um, which is lower than that of the uh, Kuiper Belt object and it would slowly drop out of the Kuiper Belt and over the period of millions, thousands upon millions of years um, the orbit would slowly decay and it would eventually smash into Earth and that would vaporize the water into water vapor that would then condense in the atmosphere and form uh, rain which would eventually form uh, oceans if enough of them hit which is what we assume happened in the very early days of the solar system. And that's why the Kuiper Belt is such an interesting, um, interesting view of um, of the solar system, because it doesn't act because um, we know so little about it, and yet it could um, it could show just how um, how life began in um, in our um, on our little planet of Earth. A lot of people say it is kind of pointless. Um, exploring the outer solar system because there isn't really much there it's just balls of ice what do you really want to know about that personally i disagree i think it's a new frontier and as a lot of people have been saying on twitter recently it is the end of an era with regards to planetary exploration this is the last known well sort of pseudo planet because obviously pluto was a planet before it got uh, demoted back in 2006 um, this is the last known planet we have left to explore. We obviously have other dwarf planets in the Kuiper Belt and um, such a, other dwarf planets such as Ceres, which we have left to explore and stuff like that. Obviously, we are exploring Ceres with Dawn at the moment um, in the um, with the NASA Dawn mission, obviously. And um, but there are other Kuiper Belt objects out there at the moment, uh, such as Maki Maki. You've probably never heard that name before if uh, you're not familiar with Kuiper Belt objects. Um, but Maki Maki. All strange sorts of names, all variations of different strange weird Hawaiian sounding names that we have not explored yet. We just know their rough shapes and stuff like that. And so it really is a new frontier and like I say it's right on the edge of our solar system. So without we go out of here and it's basically into the Oort cloud after that which is right on the very very edge on the border between interstellar space and the gravitational well of the sun. Uh, that's basically just even like, I don't really, I'm not really too sure what the Oort Cloud is, I think it's very very, I think it's just full of asteroids and stuff like that, but like I say, we know even less about the Oort Cloud than we do about the Kuiper Belt. And so that's why I'm very very excited about New Horizons, you guys should be too. Um, I can encourage you to try and uh, send a mission to ELU uh, with Kerbal Space Program. That's my challenge to you guys, my exercise to the reader, as Scott Manley would say. That's my challenge for you guys this week, is to send a mission um, with a craft with a similar look to this, um, to fly by ELU, maybe get some images if you have Tarsia Space Technology installed, if you install some form of Space Telescope mod. Um, obviously I haven't got a space telescope here, I've just used some of the narrowband scanners to make up the lorry, which is, I think is the long range, I can't remember what the abbreviation is, it's L-O-R-R-I. Um, it's like long, long range reconnaissance imager or something like that, which is basically takes black and white images of Pluto. We then have another camera, which I forget the name of on here as well, which takes um, measuring measurements of the surface of Pluto, what sort of... Um, what sort of substances it composes of, it then uses that to make a color Im a color um, chart which is then added to the black and white image and that's where you can see all of the color images that you, can, that you see from the New Horizons team that are posting on Twitter all the time and I strongly recommend that you guys go follow the, them on Twitter because they have posted some rather nice images. You can see as, as New Horizons is getting closer, we can see on the moon of Sharon, you can see a nice little crater on the sort of like the, the northern hemisphere 
Um, it's very, very cool actually. It looks kind of like a Death Star, and it's I think that's kind of, it's kind of awesome. Uh, it does look a lot smaller than I was expecting, but then again, um, we haven't actually got uh, close up yet. We're still a few million miles away from from Pluto itself yet. We still got four days, like I say, before the actual encounter as of recording this. Um, also, as we've gotten close in the past couple of days, we've actually been seen, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen um, me post a photo of it. We're in Pluto's southern hemisphere, we have a lighter looking region, uh, which looks like a love heart, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, like I say, I'm very excited for this mission. A uh, couple of things you may not know about the New Horizons mission, though, just before I leave you guys. First thing is that um, inside there are a few extra instrument and extra sort of secret features that the team that built New Horizons has actually um, hidden in there um, for the journey. One such thing is an American flag which is obviously um, obviously not um, too too strange. Another thing is a CD-ROM containing a um, list of names of both the New Horizons team that built the spacecraft and around, I think, 2,000 people who actually um, put their names down to begin with. This is very, very similar to what Orion have done, the Orion spacecraft, um, which has obviously been tested by NASA at the moment, their new deep space exploration vehicle. They're on, they're down for getting people's names to actually, I think it's either engraved on like the side or the inside of the capsule or it's just um, on the just like on board the capsule somewhere your name is aboard the capsule and you can sign up for free on NASA's website to actually have your name put on for that it's pretty cool I did that if you look back on my Twitter history ages ago you'll see my I posted a screenshot of my um, ticket to Mars that they give you at the end which is very very cool uh, but I think one of the nicest touches of the um, inside of New Horizons itself obviously I can't replicate it here is um, a portion of ashes from uh, Clyde Tombar. In case you're not aware who of who Clyde Tombar is, he is the discoverer of Pluto. He discovered it back in the 1930s. Um, he's very, 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 very sweet little man, actually. Um, I watched an interview that uh, was done with him not long before he died in 1997. And um, he was he was talking about how um, Pluto made his day, um, discovering Pluto made his day and stuff like that. It was such a real sweet interview. He's clearly proud of his achievement, and rightly so, because this planet has actually won the hearts of a lot of people um, over the next few over the past um, few decades that it has been known about. I myself, Pluto is one of my favourite planets. I'd say Mars is probably my ultimate favourite, but I think Pluto is definitely either the second or the third. Um, obviously behind, everyone's behind Earth because Earth is home planet, but uh, Earth can be boring sometimes. It's nice to see alien worlds and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, a lot of people like Pluto because it's sort of like the plucky underdog out at the edge of the out of the edge of the solar system that no one really knows. And then obviously there's the fiasco going on of whether it's a planet or not, or whether it's a dwarf planet. I'm not really one to debate about that. I'm personally of someone that's not particularly educated in the in the realm of planet. Uh, classification. I just like to let other people um, make those decisions for me, and like, and sort of, I'll just go along with those um, within that respect. But personally, I think it would be nice if Pluto was reinstated as a planet. But if uh, science says it isn't, then science says it isn't, I suppose. But like I say, obviously Clyde Tombard died back in 1997, unfortunately. But as a kind of fitting tribute, uh, the New Horizons team managed to acquire a portion of his ashes and they're in a little canister on the inside of um, the New Horizons spacecraft. And so the discover discoverer of Pluto will get to see his discovery up close uh, for one final time and then he will um, remain in space and among the cosmos um, exploring the Kuiper Belt for all of eternity and I think that's kind of sweet to be fair um, that's certainly something that I'd like to do if I when I went out that's something um, something that I'd love to um, love to experience um, as a send-off put my some of my ashes on a spacecraft and send it into deep space I don't know if that's just my um, my dream here but um, yeah, that's pretty much everything with regards to the actual Pluto mission. You can see my mission, my replica of New Horizons. It's very terribly built, I do have to say. A lot of this was built with the offset tool in Kerbal Space Program. I just used some radiators for the actual build. 
Obviously, aside from that, we've just got the normal antenna here in the RTG, which is obviously um, reminiscent of the New Horizon spacecraft. But yeah, July 14th is the encounter. I believe some television stations in the UK, uh, including the BBC. BBC are hosting a special Sky at Night episode covering the flyby. And also National Geographic are uh, releasing some sort of documentary on the matter. Um, not quite sure what it's about yet. I haven't actually seen that advertised. I've just been told about it. But I know that uh, the BBC are actually hosting a Sky at Night special if you want to watch that in the UK. US, um, there's almost certainly going to be something on it because obviously this is a US-led project. And um, I wish the New Horizons team the best of luck with their Pluto flyby. And here's to the end of an era of planetary exploration in our solar system. My name is Bradders. I'm signing off. And as always, guys, peace out.